Hello. Today I'm solving the February March 2020 variant for AS Chemistry 9701. Variant 2 2, paper 2. The first question is on ionization energies across period 2. Construct an equation to represent the first ionization energy of oxygen, right? So we know that ionization energy is the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state. So oxygen has to be in the gaseous state, right? Also remember the state symbols cannot be in subscript. They need to be along the same line as the elements, all right? So this turns into a cation. Right, and one mole of electrons is released. You had an alternate option. You could also write this loss of electrons. This also works. This is fine. State and explain the general trend in first ionization energies across period two. All right. So what happens? First ionization energies increase across period 2 this is not this is not enough to get you one mark you need to write something else due to increased due to increased nuclear attraction for valence or outer electrons so this is really important this gets you one mark now we're just going to explain why this attraction occurs increased attraction occurs this is due to an increase in nuclear charge right so nuclear charge increases Or you could also say positive nuclear charge increases, or there's alternate wording the number of protons in the nucleus increases across the period. All right? And the last mark is for saying that there is similar shielding of outer electrons or you could say electrons are added to the same shell electrons are in the same shell right electrons are added to the same shell this also works right or you could say that there is a slight increase in shielding that is fine or same shielding works as well okay same similar everything is fine so why does A not follow the trend? As you can see, oxygen, it has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2. So what's the oxygen, uh, what's the proton number of oxygen? It's 8, right? So 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. What about nitrogen? It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So nitrogen has half-filled orbitals, right? In the 2p orbital. What about oxygen? It has one 2p orbital, which is, you know, full, or it has two electrons in one 2p orbital, or one p orbital, that's fine. If you just say p orbital, that's fine. But if you mess up, if you say something like 3p orbital, you're not going to get a mark, all right? So, due to this, you know, like, we know that as we go across the period, right? proton number is supposed to increase which results in increased attraction right this is their similar shielding this is true for oxygen since proton number is more than nitrogen it is 8 compared to 7 right nuclear charge increases so attraction is supposed to increase right but on the other hand this spin pair repulsion this actually overweighs the increased attraction so this is a new point that's been added to the mark scheme all right this wasn't there before so we need to say that there is spin pair, there is spin pair repulsion of electrons 
in 2p orbital you could just say p orbital 2p orbital of oxygen right this overweighs this overweighs the increased nuclear charge right ionization energy was supposed to increase but the spin pair repulsion actually overweighs that factor okay what's the electron configuration of e it's in the third period right so it's going to be 1s2 2s2 2p6 right now check this there is a huge jump in ionization energy between the third and fourth one right as a result it should be 3s2 3p1 since it has three electrons in its valence shell right due to this huge jump that is what we uh, need to say right the the greatest jump is between third and fourth ionization energies this indicates that there are three electrons in the outer shell right I mean if you say that uh, it's in group 3 or in group 13 uh, it might be okay but it's just best to break it down to the examiner okay sometimes it may be vague what does uh, being in group 3 mean right you're supposed to break it down to the examiner in the most in the simplest form basically okay define reducing agent so guys remember a reducing agent is a a species that donates electrons okay so a reducing agent reduces somebody else and is oxidized itself in the process so it donates electrons now always answer oxidizing and reducing agents in terms of electrons okay a reducing agent donates electrons and an oxidizing agent uh, oxidizes somebody else but becomes reduced itself so uh, it's a species which accepts electrons an oxidizing agent and a reducing agent reduces somebody else decreases the oxidation number of somebody else right you could also say gives up electrons loses electrons or a species that decreases the oxidation number of another okay so na2o with water this is a basic oxide it's going to form an alkali right so it's going to be naoh to balance it we need two what does amphoteric mean it reacts with both acids and bases or you could say it is a substance which shows both acidic and basic behavior both work okay shows both acidic and basic behavior okay Al2O3 is purified from bauxite in several steps the first step involves heating Al2O3 with an excess of NaOH. A colorless solution forms. Okay. So we are going to heat Al2O3, an amphoteric oxide, with a base. So we know that Al2O3 has the capacity to react with both acids and bases. So this will be a feasible reaction. This is a possibility. It's going to form NaAl OH4. This is a possibility. So what's the name of this compound? sodium aluminate this is hydrated sodium aluminate okay this is sodium aluminate it is it can also be anhydrous but this is a possibility right to balance this what do we need we need three moles of water right to balance the oxygen 
and two moles of this basically uh, you balance it like this first you give the two to balance uh, aluminium then you need a two here right to balance the sodium and to balance oxygen you need a three here right so there were other options though you could do this Al2O3 plus 2NaOH is equal to 2NaAlO2 plus H2. This is also sodium aluminate, but this is the anhydrous form. Okay, this is the pure form. All right. So these are the two options you should opt for. Any one of these two, okay? Al2O3 is used as a catalyst in the dehydration of alcohols. We do know that. So we want to show the effect of a catalyst on rate using a Boltzmann distribution. So suppose this is the activation energy for the uncatalyzed reaction. What happens when we use the catalyst? This is the Ea, the activation energy with catalyst, right? So what happens? A greater proportion of molecules now have energy greater than the activation energy, right? So this, uh, you get one mark for this next. The second mark is like for some reason in this mark scheme they did not say uh, the catalyst increases the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy. Thing is it, that's going to be a repetitive point. You're already showing that on the diagram, right? So that point is already done with. You can also write it down. It's fine. They won't cut marks for it, but it's not required here. It's always better to write it down though, right? Remember that. The next one is a greater proportion. That's the best wording. A greater proportion, or you can say more molecules, right? A greater proportion of molecules have energy or with energy. So this is the key point, okay? It's greater than or equal to activation energy, right? Greater than or equal to. Now, the frequency of effective or successful collisions increases, okay? So, P406 is a white solid which has a melting point 24, okay? Uh, it reacts with water to form H3PO3. All right, so what does this tell us about the structure and bonding of P406? So what is the structure? The structure is simple, right? Why? Or you could say molecular, why? Because it has a low melting point, okay? Now, what about the bonding? The bonding is covalent. Why? Because, so uh, you cannot say it reacts with water, okay? You need to break it down. What is the reaction? Because it is hydrolyzed. You need to say that the reaction with water is actually hydrolysis. You could also say breakdown, right? But you cannot say reacts with water. If you just wrote simple covalent, Okay, if you just wrote simple covalent, you would get one mark. Determine the oxidation number of phosphorus, H3PO3. So oxygen is always minus 2, minus 2 into 3 is minus 6, this is plus 3. So phosphorus has to be plus 3, right? When P4O6 is heated with oxygen, it forms P4O10. The enthalpy change of formation of P4O10 is minus 3012 kilojoules per mole. So let's make a Hess cycle. P4O6 plus O2, 2O2 is equal to P4O10. We know this, this is minus 1372. Now, for formation, remember, you need the basic elements below, right? You need the basic elements down below. Phosphorus exists as P4, by the way. You need oxygen, right? So, the arrows should always be upwards in a Hess cycle with enthalpy of formation. So, we are forming one mole of P4O10. 
and one mole of P4O6. So we don't actually know the enthalpy of formation of P4O6. This is unknown actually. So we can label it as HF, just HF, right? And this is known, this is minus 3012. So just follow the arrows. You either have a direct route from P4 plus O2 to P4 O10, or you can take the detour using these two arrows, right? So we can say HF minus 1372 is actually equal to minus 3012. So if you solve this, you end up with minus 1640. That's all. Write an equation for the reaction of P4O10 with water. Okay, so it's an acidic oxide. P4O10 plus H2O is equal to, we know that we're going to form phosphoric acid, right? So it's going to be H3PO4. If you want to balance this, we need a 4 here. And we need 6, six moles of water. HPO3 was also accepted, but just go for this. This is much better. Construct an equation to show how NO2 is regenerated uh, in the catalytic oxidation of SO2. So we know that NO2 is the catalyst, right? So NO can react with oxygen again. NO can react with oxygen again to form NO2, right? So this is a, the new addition to the syllabus. NO2 can also react with unburned hydrocarbons to form photochemical smog. State the product of this reaction that contributes to photochemical smog. The reaction between nitrogen oxides and unburned hydrocarbons, right? It's PAN, P-A-N, or peroxyacetyl nitrate. New addition to the 2022 syllabus. This was interesting. So the equilibrium reaction in equation one, this one is a two percent two. They're saying that it is exothermic. Okay. So just how the position of this equilibrium differs at a height of twenty. This is our subject compared with a height of fifty kilometers. So check this out. At twenty, the temperature is around minus sixty, and at fifty the temperature is around zero. So basically at 50 degrees Celsius, the temperature is higher. And at 20 kilometers, the temperature is lower at minus 60, all right. So how are we gonna answer this? Think about it. At 20 km, right, the temperature is minus 60 degrees Celsius. And at 50 km, it's around zero degrees Celsius, okay. And we know that the forward reaction is exothermic. So, uh, a lower temperature actually favors the forward reaction rate, so the equilibrium should lie to the right. That's the logic. The position of the equilibrium actually moves or lies farther lies farther to the right at 20 kilometers okay why this is because the forward reaction is exothermic so we know the Lachlan-Lewis principle states that we're going to oppose the change and we need to mention something else the forward reaction is exothermic and we need to mention that and temperature is colder at 20 degrees Celsius, all right? You need to mention this, or you can just say that there is due to the decrease in temperature, uh, the equilibrium moves to the right, right? So it's basically the position of the equilibrium lies further to the right at 20 degrees Celsius compared to 50. Why? Because at 20, the temperature is lower, or there is a decrease in temperature, and the forward reaction is exothermic. That's what you need to write, okay? So question three is on halogens. So this is the new mark scheme. This is what we need to follow. So just remember that halogens are oxidizing agents, 
right? Halogens are oxidizing agents. So, basically, how do oxidizing agents act? They are species that gain electrons. So, think about this. You have chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Who's the better oxidizing agent? It's chlorine, right? Why? Chlorine can easily oxidize hydrogen, right? Why? Because it's smaller. It has a smaller atomic radii, radius. And it has higher electronegativity, right? So it is more likely to attract or take the electron from hydrogen. So as we go down the group, what happens? Size increases, electronegativity decreases. The They are less likely to attract the electron, right? and they become weaker oxidizing agents. So we know that down the group shielding does increase, right? Because electrons are added to new shells. But the greater nuclear charge actually outweighs the, or overweighs the increased shielding. What does this mean? This is a point in the mark scheme. The greater nuclear charge overweighs the increased shielding all right what does this actually refer to so basically we want the halogen to accept electrons easily right as an oxidizing agent however as we go down the group proton number is increasing right so there's increased attraction for the valence electrons so this is actually, this greater nuclear charge, right? It actually overweighs the increased shielding down the group as the atom becomes larger. So what is the implication of this? Why does reactivity? So the first one, I'm going to explain again. Reactivity decreases down the group or the reaction becomes less vigorous down the group. You guys know that um, hydrogen reacts with fluorine in cool conditions, dark conditions. Hydrogen reacts with chlorine with UV light or high temperature. For bromine, it requires higher temperature. And for iodine, it requires much more higher temperature, 450 degrees Celsius, provided by a hot glass rod. It provides the activation energy. So it becomes less vigorous down the group, right? Less explosive. So what is the main reason? It's basically due to the strength decreasing strength as an oxidizing agent to decreasing you need to think of halogens what are they they are oxidizing agents and they accept electrons since their ability to accept electrons decreases down the group right that's why they become weaker right and the Reactivity also decreases the enthalpy. So, to get the second mark, you had around six points. You had to write any two from them. These are the points electronegativity decreases down the group of halogens. We're talking about halogens. Halogens are less attractive to electron addition they become weaker oxidizing agents or you could word it this way oxidizing power decreases down the group there is another point, by the way. Atoms become larger. The bond dissociation energy of halogen halogen XX halogen halogen becomes smaller down the group. Although they did tell us to ignore the hydrogen halogen bond here, though. All right. 
It says the product of several different reactions. Uh, run equation for reaction 1. SiCl4 plus H2O is equal to SiO2 plus 4HCl. So we need a 2 here. So salts, right? Sodium halides, they react with constant H2SO4. However, you guys know that sodium bromide and sodium iodide undergo multiple reactions. Why is that? Because they're stronger reducing agents. So constant H2SO4, the oxidizing agent, it is actually strong enough to oxidize them. But since chlorine is a stronger oxidizing agent than H2SO4, H2SO4 can't really oxidize chloride, okay? So what actually occurs? No redox reaction occurs, only an acid-base reaction occurs. Remember, it is not a neutralization reaction since water is not formed. Check this out. Water is not formed, okay? So NaHSO4 plus HCl, water is not formed. So what happens here? The acid-base reaction will occur in the first step, followed by redox. So you needed two to get one mark and three to get to score all three, all two marks, okay? What about the explanation? I just told you guys H2SO4 is strong enough to oxidize NaBr or HBr, you know, the product of, of the reaction or just bromide Br minus. When heated with the Bunsen burner, HCl does not decompose, whereas Hi decomposes. Why is that? This is mainly because HCl bond is stronger than HI or you could say the bond dissociation the bond dissociation energy decreases down the group this is also fine the hydrogen halides dissolve in water to form strong bronsted lorry acids so what is a bronsted lorry acid mainly it is a proton donor. Bronsler acid is a proton or H plus donor. Now we need to say what strong means. So it's a proton donor which fully or completely dissociates, which fully dissociates in water or in aqueous solution. This is it mainly. Now this is also a new addition to the syllabus. So don't misinterpret it. NaOH is being added to the acid. So the initial pH is gonna be acidic. And we are adding an alkali to the acid, right? So pH is going to increase over time. So think about it. HBr and NaOH and HBr and NH3. All three of these are actually monobasic acids and monoacidic bases. So they will react in a 1 is to 1 molar ratio, right? So we are adding 0.1 mole per dm cube of NaOH to 0.1 mole per dm cube of HBr and 25 cm cube. So think about it. Since they have the same concentration and the same molar ratio, we are going to need 25 cm cube of NaOH and 25 cm cube of NH3 to neutralize it. So our vertical section is going to be at 25. This was our first point, okay? The vertical section is at 25. Now the initial pH. So HBr, right? The initial pH, think about it. HBr is a strong acid. Strong acids typically have a pH of 1. So the marking point was at less than or equal to 2. It had to be less than or equal to 2. So it needed a pH of 1, maybe. Both of them started 1. And since it's a strong acid, right, we know that the vertical section is going to be a bit taller comparatively. It's going to be, be a bit taller. For a weak acid, it typically uh, starts at 8, 7 or 8. But for a strong acid, it starts at 11, 10, 11, 12, maybe. Okay? So it's going to go, I mean, it's going to start at, sorry, for a weak acid, it's at 7 or 6. For a strong acid, it's like at 4, 3 or 4, okay? So it's going to be like this. Then we get the vertical section. Since NaOH is a strong base, it's going to end at 13-ish. At around 13. 
when all of it has been added it's gonna end at 13 so 7 minus 3 4 we're gonna add 4 so we're at 11 yeah the graph is going to be like this this is typical for as strong as a strong base what did I do check this 7 plus minus 4 those are the points where the vertical section ends right 7 plus minus 4 so it's actually 3 3 to 3 to 11 the length of the vertical section and for a weak acid and weak base it's typically 7 plus minus 1 usually all right so 6 to 8 typically so since this is a strong acid it's still gonna start at 3ish like this you draw the vertical section but now it's going to change basically the last ph the final ph cannot be 13 right it has to be less than 12 it has to be less than 12 at maybe 11 or something 11 or 10 right and i also taught you something that the vertical section will end at 8 the vertical section will end at 8 right and we can't have it crossing 12 it cannot cross 12 okay you need to remember that it cannot cross 12 and there will be a kink in the drawing due to the buffer action of the weak acid you can learn about this in a2 so like typically we would have drawn it like this right but we can't since it has a buffering action the curve should be like this this is the best diagram that you could draw possibly all right so let's uh, let's make it end at 11 ish let's make it end at 11 so the diagram is going to be like this okay this is the, the perfect sigmoid shape okay ask me if you have any questions so now we finally have organic right so hbr reacts with propene to form two bromoalkanes either one bromopropane or this is one bromopropane or check this two bromopropane one or two bromopropane so we want to show the major product we know that two bromopropane is going to be the major product right so we need that let's see what are the marking points we first give the dipole del plus and del minus then we show the curly arrows right always remember it's going to be a curly arrow from the electron rich region to the electron deficient region like this so the next step is going to be remember the carbocation is going to be the carbocation is going to be at the carbon which has more alkyl groups so compare this carbon it has none right what about this one it has one alkyl group so the carbocation is going to be there right and hydrogen is basically reacted with that carbon and the double bond is gone that carbon now has four bonds but the carbon uh, in the middle right the carbon in the middle it has three bonds right it still has three bonds and it turned into a carbocation so who's going to attack this carbocation the bromide anion that we formed in the first step right so we draw another curly arrow and we end up with this ch3 c ch3 h br right this is it. two bromopropane so why are they not produced in equal amounts why, why is this the major product right mainly because you need to make a comparison the two degree carbocation right formed here the two degree carbocation is more stable keyword is more stable than the one degree carbocation why now we are going to answer why due to due to the positive inductive effect or you know the electron donating effect right of two methyl groups or you could say two alkyl groups that's fine so we know that halogen alkenes react with NaOH in two ways under two conditions one if 
NaOH is dissolved in water and two, if NaOH is dissolved in ethanol. Alcoholic conditions, alcoholic solvent, right? So let's see what happens. If it's water, a uh, uh, nucleophilic substitution reaction takes place or hydrolysis, we call it hydrolysis. So Br is replaced with OH. So this is CH3, CH2, CH2, OH. This is propane one all. You could write that down if you want. Don't write both though. So check this, CH3, CH2, CH2, Br plus NaOH is equal to CH3, CH2, CH2, OH plus NaBr. So this is our inorganic product, right? What about the next one, in ethanol? A, an elimination reaction actually takes place, right? So CH3, CH2, CH2, Br. This reacts with NaOH to form, right? CH3, CH2, or CH3, CH, CH2. So what did we lose from the left-hand side? We lost one hydrogen and one bromide. Okay, one hydrogen and one bromide. So where do they go actually? Remember that NaOH has two parts, Na and OH. And we lost one molecule of, you know, HBr, right? So where do these H and Br go actually? So the H combines with OH to form H2O and the Br combines with Na to form NaBr, right? So it's going to be NaBr plus H2O and the product is going to be CH3, CH, CH2, right? Elimination. Next, we have JNK, which are found in plant oils. Observation with J, 2,4 DNPH. Since there's an aldehyde, we're going to see a red, orange, yellow precipitate, right? An orange precipitate, PPT, or solid. You could write the full form, by the way. Tolerance, right? Since it has an aldehyde, we're going to see a silver, a silver mirror, okay? or a silver precipitate, that's fine. Sodium metal, right? It's gonna react due to the presence of alcohol and carbox alcohol group, right? So we're gonna see effervescence or bubbling. Effervescence or bubbling or fizzing. Okay, now J has two optical isomers, okay. So how do you draw these diagrams? This is how you do it. First draw the center carbon, now, Choose what you want. Let's make OH go on top. We can do that. This doesn't have to be laterally inverted, the one on the top, okay? Now, CHO is on the right. So, suppose if you draw CHO like this, you need to ensure that you draw CHO like this, okay? Next, if you show CH3 here, like this, CH3, then you can't draw CH3 here. That would be wrong. You won't get one mark. You have need to draw CH3 like this. It needs to be a mirror image basically, okay? This is what I want to teach you. So it's going to be CH3. What about the last one? It's COCH3. That's a methyl ketone group, right? COCH3. So COCH3. So it's going to be C O C H three. Remember the carbon has to be bonded to the center one. Alright. Now next part K is used to make the addition polymer for perspex. Okay, identify L. What happened here? Esterification, right? We added a one carbon alcohol to the carboxy acid group. So what is the one carbon alcohol? It's none other than methanol C H three O H. What are the conditions for esterification? A few drops of, you know, H2SO4. A few drops of concentrated H2SO4. Plus heat under reflux. Remember, reflux is the keyword here. Draw one repeat unit of perspex. Okay. Here we go. This is it dangling bonds right use information to suggest how the infrared spectrum of m and perspex would differ so perspex doesn't have an alkene but m does right so perspex would actually be missing this uh, this you know uh, absorption in this range so we can say that perspex trademark registered right 
would not have absorption would not have an absorption at you know 1500 to 1680 per centimeter since it does not have the alkene or the C double bond C right next K can be made from propanone in three step synthesis as shown okay so what's the first step it's actually nucleophilic addition right so uh, they just wrote addition for some reason in the mark scheme but you could write nucleophilic addition you'll get marks they said ignore ignore those words they aren't marking you for those okay and what reagent do we need we need kcn and hcn okay hcn is the reagent and kcn is the catalyst next um reaction 2 is acidic hydrolysis they just wanted hydrolysis and for this we need a dilute acid you could write dilute acid or h plus equals or any other acid hcl equals h 2 over equals that's fine okay but you need to mention equals or dilute it can't be concentrated so al2o3 what does it do the next step we know that al2o3 is a dehydrating agent right so this is mainly elimination or dehydration both work so if you guys have any questions you can ask me